Hi everyone and welcome to ABCs of Anesthesia and today we have another live Viva session and so hey Rebecca how's it going? You're about to sit your exams? Yeah it's going well I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the feedback you've got so far? Uh, what are you trying to work on at the moment? Um, at the moment, I'm trying to be a little bit more succinct with my main issues when I'm when I'm answering the questions. Um, sometimes I I find that my mind is running ahead of what the next question might be, what the next issue might be, and then I don't listen so well to the question that is actually being asked. Um, and then I fluff. And I, I fill I fill the space with fluff sometimes. So I'm trying to rein that in a little bit. I'm definitely guilty of that. Like I feel like when your mind works at 100 miles an hour. Like you, you, you literally, you're know, saying more, you know, part of me, except for not, I remember in my first part exam, just totally missing the question. There was, I kept answering another question and it was painstaking for the poor examiner. Luckily I passed at the end, but yeah, it was just one of those moments where take a breath, pause. And yeah, we'll definitely, this, this particular viva may have elements of that. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, why don't we start with the STEM? I'll put it up on the screen and I'll also read it out to people who, who are listening on the podcast. Um, and you, essentially the full Viva will be on the final exam course, but you'll get most of this Viva without my feedback um, just on YouTube. Uh, so let's start with this one. Okay, hopefully you can see a STEM there. Mm -hmm. And the STEM reads, you are asked to review your next patient, a 25-year-old, 130-kilogram transgender female, pronoun she, her, hers, for augmentation mammoplasty with implants and maybe lipofilling. She has a past history of asthma, anxiety, depression, obesity, uh, 130 kilos, as we mentioned. She's 170 centimeters tall with a BMI of roughly 45. The medication she's on is Simbicort, Salbutamol, Venlafaxine, Spironolactone, and oral estrogen. She has allergies to kiwi fruit, avocado, and also she has a whole body rash with penicillin. She's very concerned about the impact of her hormone treatment and anesthesia. What do you advise her? And I think I'll give everyone just about yeah, let's go two minutes. You can pause here um, if you're watching because I'll skip uh, through the two minutes and make it only five seconds in the actual video. Um, but let's get you started. Starting now. And so, yeah, just start with, do you want to show everyone what you use that two minutes for? Maybe tell us a bit about how, yeah, how you approach that. Um, this is my page. And so what I've spent that two minutes doing is writing down the information that I've got from the Viva and then blocking it into um, patient. And this is where I sort of put pathology stuff, uh -huh. um, the procedure that they're having, uh -huh. the any professional issues. So I put autonomy here for her. She's probably going to like autonomy and discussion is going to be important for her. Uh -huh. um, and then the setting I normally put here whether I'm in admission clinic or it's 2 a.m. and we're coming into ED. And then this is where I put what the actual question is. Mm -hmm. And I try to number the issues that I want to address. Good. And did you write um, the answer to the question first before you do the other stuff or did you do the other stuff first? Um, I put the question in the bottom right and I do everything. I make sure that I read every line of the mm -hmm. um of the stem but what I was doing is I was starting at the bottom and then going back around oh, but good. then I was finding that I was running out of time so, so you I just, just read the whole thing through and put the question at the bottom I've, I've got the context for the question did you answer the question in that bottom right before you started doing the other patient pathology oh yes before I started I started writing what I wanted to address in the bottom right before I started numbering the rest of the issues well, can you show that up again to the screen Okay, good. So you got the, um, the estrogen and the spironolactone, and you've got yeah, essentially dot point answers there. Uh, I like that you've got the kiwi, uh, so latex allergy. So you've got an association with that. Antibiotics testing, perfect. And yeah, that that all that all looks really good. Let's get cracking with the Viva. Uh, so Rebecca, candidate one, two, three. Uh, do you understand the question? Yes. Excellent. Uh, she's very concerned about the impact of hormone treatment and anesthesia. What do you advise her? So I'd like to thank her to, for being so engaged in her anesthesia because that's not usual for my patients um, and gives me a little bit of time to 
gain some rapport with her. And then I'd like to address any issues that she has, anticipating that she wants to discuss her estrogen therapy and her spironolactone antiandrogenic therapy. Um, and I'd outline the concerns that I would have for her having um, that extra therapy under the anesthetic and the increased or the special risks that that comes with um, and how we're going to address those special risks and then talk to her about medication management perioperatively. And then I would go on to talk about the issues um, that I foresee for her given the rest of her medical history. And I'd also take a hist some further history from her, specifically being concerned about if she's had previous airway feminization, like um, voice feminization surgery, um, laryngeal surgery, um, and then um, also outlining the other issues being her obesity the tendency that she might have to be latex allergic or latex anaphylactic given her um, allergies to kiwi fruit and avocado, um, exploring a little bit more about antibiotic allergies that she may have given that history of the penicillin all over body rash, whether she's had any testing for that, and then go through a normal, a usual consent um, process with her. Let's focus on the estrogen and the spironolactone. Let's say she hasn't had any vo voice changing surgery. Actually, quickly, what are the different kinds of surgeries that um, transgender females may have to alter their voice? So there can be a range of different surgical um, procedures to alter the or feminize um, mm. a woman's voice. Um, some of them actually cut into the thyroid cartilage and shorten the thyroid cartilage as well as shortening the vocal cords themselves. Some of them debulk the vocal cords. Um, others put um, tensioning wires through the anterior vocal cords, um, which can sometimes then regress. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So let's say she hasn't had any uh, uh, voice changing operations or any kind of laryngeal operations. Tell me about estrogen and spironolactone's effects in anesthesia. So the estrogen um, comes with a few different uh, or a few extra considerations. So it increases the risk of venous thromboembolism. Um, it uh, is bound by sugamidex. Um, withdrawals can occur when we withhold them perioperatively, uh, which can um, manifest as irritability and mood changes. Um, it uh, decreases the activity of pseudocholinesterase, which may have an, um, a prolonging effect for neuromuscular blockade from um, succinothonium. Uh, and it also decreases the concentration of circulating albumin, which is important for our highly protein-bound drugs. Like what? Like local anesthetics and propofol. Um, which, which local anesthetics in particular? Uh, bupivacaine. Is there any evidence for this being a problem? Uh, we don't fully understand the extent of this issue. So we just have to have a lower threshold for considering local anesthetic systemic toxicity um, as part of our anesthetic care. There isn't evidence to say, to suggest, to uh, support that th there would be an increased rate of postoperative nausea and vomiting um, in transgender women, but I think it's something to consider, um, especially with anybody who is a non-smoker and, and otherwise a young female patient. Mm, okay. How about the venous thromboembolism risk? You said this increased. Um... What is that risk? What are you going to do about it? So for this patient especially, I'm concerned about her venous thromboembolism risk because this is a prolonged procedure and she's already an obese woman. Um, so I would be using TEDs as well as Flotrons and I would be having a discussion with the surgeon about whether we should give heparin preoperatively, uh, which is often something that we do in our breast cancer patients. Uh, and so that would be a multidisciplinary discussion with our surgeon. Mm -hmm. And do you, are there any recent guidelines for this? Are they... Any recommendations about VT prophylaxis uh, with estrogen therapy? Uh, there probably are. Yeah, all good. Uh, how about spironolactone? What are you thinking there? So spironolactone, we know well in its use for advanced liver failure and as a diuretic medication. So we know that it increases the risk of acute kidney injury perioperatively and um, so, and to avoid intraoperative um, hypotension, we would usually withhold it on the day of surgery. Um, it also alters our electrolyte balance um, using that aldosterone pathway. So it is, and it does increase the risk of hyperkalemia. Um, and it also uh, does put her at risk of having liver dysfunction. So I would want to see LFTs additionally, uh, whereas if she wasn't on a spironolactone, then I wouldn't be testing LFTs for this patient. Okay, good. She, let's say she's very happy with what you've said and sounds like there's a, a good plan for her operation. But what do you want to know? You mentioned a few other things already, but what aside from... Uh, what you've already mentioned. What do you want to know on assessment? 
So I would take a usual anesthetic history about previous anaesthet anesthetics that she had and, and ensure that she has no family history of um, scolene apnea or malignant hyperthermia, ask her about her previous operations. And she, it's good to know that she hasn't had any feminize, voice feminization surgery from my point of view, from an airway management point of view. Um, I would examine her airway um, and um, inquire about her, if she's had any allergy testing specifically around antibiotics, because I want to know if she is at risk of having anaphylaxis to uh, my cephalosporin um, prophylactic antibiotics that I'm going to give her. Um, and then we would have a discussion about um, performing uh, regional anesthesia as well as analgesia, the usual analgesia that I give her and the usual antiemetic prophylaxis that I give her. Yeah. And then I would advise her that I'd like her to withhold her spironolactone on the day of surgery. What else do you want to know preoperatively? Uh, oh, I would also do a, a usual um, exercise tolerance assessment. Yep, let's say exercise tolerance is fine. Um, what what concerns you specifically about the airway from what you know already? Oh, sorry. I, I'd also inquire about whether she has risk factors for sleep apnea or if anybody has noticed that she apneas or snores through what? a closed door because, because of her obesity. What are the other things that concern you about asthma and obesity in this patient? So she... Um, she is in class three obesity at this at this BMI, um, and her asthma symptoms are likely to be um, confounded by her obesity as well. Um, so she can have she can also have an obstructive and restrictive pattern to her breathing. Oh. And tell me more about your asthma assessment. So uh, I would want to assess the severity of her asthma, whether she's previously been in in the admitted to hospital or admitted to the intensive care unit and also whether she's had any um, episodes recently of nighttime asthma, uh, whether she has any known triggers such as anti-inflammatory medications um, and whether she's needing to use her salbutamol frequently. Anything else? Any upper respiratory tract infections recently? Let's say she did have a course of prednisolone three months ago with an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, what else do you want to know? whether her symptoms are back at baseline um, and what is her baseline. Um, Let's say she has no symptoms currently at all. Um, what do you want to know about her obesity? Whether she has any obst obstructive sleep apnea or any signs of obesity hyperventilation um, syndrome. So I would also preoperatively, ideally, I'd like to send an ABG, see what her CO2, her resting CO2 is, uh, her awake resting CO2. And so th let's say this patient turns up to you on, onto your list, doesn't have any, uh, has had no sleep studies, no investigations for OSA. Would you do an arterial gas in her before you get her off to sleep or? Uh, no, I think I'd probably just send UECs and ask for um, her UECs because that, that would come back probably pretty quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And she might, may even have had um, renal function tests done recently and that would have um, an awake bicarb. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what, what does that tell you? Um, that would tell me if she has a, uh, an elevated PACO2. Yeah, okay. Um, what's your anaesthetic plan for her for this mammoplasty? Uh, so I would discuss with the surgeon about what their surgical requirements are, but I'm anticipating that this is going to be a long procedure um, I'm, I, and that it's going to be predominantly a supine procedure where they may need to break the bed to sit, to sit her up to um, check for asymmetry or for symmetry rather. Um, so I would perform a general anesthetic using an endotracheal tube. I would have a BIS monitor for her and I would run TIVA anesthetic. I would give her um, a regional blockade at the start of the case to minimize the amount of opioids that I need to use throughout the procedure. Um, and that's predominantly what I would do. Yeah, okay. Um, she's very concerned about pain post-op. So what would your pain plan be intraoperative and post-operatively? So for induction, I would use um, fentanyl, uh, and propofol and get her off to sleep using a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker, put down the endotracheal tube. And then what we do at our, our site is to use paravertebral blocks. But an alternative for her, given her obesity and the fact that I don't really want to have bilateral paravertebral blocks would be a PEX2 block, which would be performed with ultrasound. Quickly, um, do you, have you ever done a bilateral paravertebral block or is this only for unilateral breast surgery? It's usually for unilateral breast surgery. So Usually for bilateral, we wouldn't do bilateral paravertebrals. Uh, and what, what would you do uh, generally at your institution? It, it PEX2 block, is that the standard or? No, usually we just do the paravertebral on the side that's going to have a mistake to me. I'm thinking, I'm sort of translating 
um, yeah. information across from cancer surgery because I haven't done an augmented an augmentation memo with implants and filling before. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, I've definitely seen some studies or, or case reports where people have done bilateral paravertebrals and one of my mates definitely has done that. But uh, to go on, can, can you describe the PEC block for me? So the PEX, PEX1 block is a fascial plane block where you put at least 10 mils of local anesthetic between the pec major and the pec minor muscle at the level of the second to third rib um, using a linear probe, high frequency, 6 to 13 gigahertz um, in a superior inferior alignment. Uh, and then how, you how, how, do you, how do you place that probe if you were to show me on yourself? So this is my handy dandy probe. Yeah, nice. Place it here. Okay. So it's superior inferior. And then using your sonoplex needle from the superior aspect of the probe, um, introducing it using an in-plane um, technique uh, and then introduce at least 20, at least 10 mils in that space. And then you go on to do the PEX2 uh, aspect, which is, a, a, again, a fascial plane block um, between the PEX minor muscle and the serratus anterior mu and the serratus muscle. You need to rotate the probe about to about 60 degrees uh -huh. and then move uh, translocate the probe over the third and fourth rib okay and what what are you blocking with each block i, I use 0.2 percent rupivacaine because i can use a lot of volume which is great for a fascia plane block 0.2 uh -huh. percent. so what kind of volume are you giving with 0.2 percent so you can give um 15 mils in each and in, in each of those fascia planes for her that so would be two, 60 mils, which is 120 milligrams. Yeah, and that's that's and that's well, well below the max. Off. How long does a 0.2 percent block last? Uh, it depends. If you use additives, you can use some. You can put some clonidine in there, or you can use dexamethasone, which can be given um, systemically, mm -hmm. and you, hopefully you can get that block out to 12 to 24 hours. And why do you use 0.2 percent instead of just using 0.75 and 10 plus 10 mils of that, or 0.375 and up to 40 mils? Um, the our surgeons like to use a little bit of local with adrenaline to infiltrate into the planes, so that mm -hmm. still gives them the wriggle room to be able to use some local anaesthetic. And it's also, as from a safety point of view, I'm well below my max dose. Okay. Um, what nerves are you blocking? I, do, I can do rescue blocks as well in recovery if I need to. Okay. So what what um, uh, nerves are you blocking with with at each site? So in in the PEX one um, block where blocking the medial and lateral pectoral nerves. And then in the PEX2 uh, block, we're blocking intercostal nerves as well as intercostal brachial nerves. Okay. Um, any other nerves in PEX2? I no. think we also can get the long thoracic nerve. Okay. Um, what area are you worried about not anesthetizing using this technique? The medial aspect of the anterior chest wall. So, if we needed to get to the medial um, aspect around the sternum, then we would need to do um, a parasternal block. Any other areas that aren't potentially blocked? Um, I'm not sure. What, what's the level here? What are we getting dermatome wise? Uh, we would not get as high as T1 mm -hmm. up here. Okay. So to, to cover the more superior aspect of the chest wall, we would need to do um, a suprascapular block to get the suprascap nerve. Is there another block that you're thinking of? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Now, let's say you do the induction. Um, your reg does the airway, uh, does a reasonable job at it. It's a grade 2B view. Um, and now your reg is managing the case. They're a junior reg and you're happy that they're able to manage this case and you're in the tier room having your break, you're called in for decrease in SATs. The uh, SATs are now 87% or 100% oxygen. You hear the ventilator alarming and the surgeon has stopped and your reg is trying to improve the situation you know, with a bag in hand. Uh, at this point, what do you do? I would probably ask. I would take over. I would put the ventilator across on, onto the APL valve and turn the APL valve up to 30 confirm that I have an FI2 of 100%, mm -hmm. ask my reg and my tech to organise a suction catheter to pass down the tube. Mm -hmm. I would manually ventilate and feel the compliance of the bag in my hand. At 30 of pressure, you get tightness and then it just collapses. Okay. So I'm thinking that given the tightness of the bag, I'm thinking that I've got high airway pressures as well as hypoxemia. So, I'm think so now I'm thinking down the line of, 
Have we um, irritated her uh, lungs? Has she got bronchospasm now? Is this an exacerbation of her asthma? I'd also quickly scan the circuit and make sure that there hasn't been a disconnect or there isn't um, part of the circuit under the wheel of the ventilator, for, ex for example. Um, and then pass the let's, suction. Let's, cap let's say at this point. Just Let's say at this point, you, so you, you haven't been able to ventilate a satisfactory volume. With 30 of pressure, you've got maybe 50 mils of tidal volume in, but the rest escapes. What do you do? Turn the APL valve higher and see if I can get rise and fall of the chest and listen and see that there is equal um, air entry, that we're not endobronchial and that we don't have a pneumothorax. Okay, you have equal... See if that increased pressure is actually giving us any end tidal CO2. You get a very small blip of end tidal CO2 uh, and you hear very loud wheeze and about 100 mils of volume that you're able to get, um, but very tight circuit. Okay, so now I'm going down the differential of high airway pressures and asthma or bronchospasm. I still want to pass that that um, suction catheter to make sure that there's nothing plugging the tube. Um, yep. I think it's unlikely, but I'd like to do that and then organize for some salbutamol mm. to, put, to attach to the circuit so that we can try to... Um, uh, relax those airways. Yeah, great. So you to pass the suction catheter and you do get just a lot of mucus coming up. Um, you connect the MDI to the circuit and what, what do you do then? So now in coordination with my tech or, or my registrar, I'm going to give six to 12 puffs of salbutamol. Um, I'm also going to turn the sevoflurane on because I know that sevoflurane is good for bronchodilation. Mm -hmm. What percentage sevoflurane? So I'm going to wash it in. So I'm going to have high high fresh gas flows, turn it up to 8%, mm -hmm. keep an eye on my, my BIS and start down titrating my propofol at the same time. As you turn it up, uh, you see 0% on your monitor. Why is that? Because we're still not ventilating her. So until we have her um, across onto the sevoflurane, we, we, we can't really turn that propofol off. So mm -hmm. we just need to... Make sure that we don't end up with a completely isoelectric bis, um, but just yeah. be aware that at some stage we're going to have to get her across. Okay. The... You, you put 12, six to 12 puffs down and you manage to get some level of volume in, again, at very high pressures. So you get, say, 100 mils, 150 mils. Uh, the wheeze is still extremely loud. As you're trying to, you've got 100%, 100% the SATs are about 85%, um, and the CO2 has now climbed. We've got a very bronchospastic trace. The CO2 is about 70 so we still have like very advanced bronchospasm here. Um, our next line is to get some ketamine out of the trolley and to get some magnesium out of the trolley. Um, we've got some sevoflurane. We're trying to get some sevoflurane on. Mm -hmm. um, given that my current management has been unsuccessful, I'd like a second pair of hands. So I'd ask the reg if they can call for the DA and I'd ask the nurses if they can get the ketamine out of the cupboard for me. I know that's going to take a couple of minutes now. Let's say it's the evening and your consultant's at home and everything is, uh, uh, they're 20 minutes away. So you've got a couple of registrars, two nurses and yourself. Okay. Well, still, that's great. That's that's good. I've got at least a couple of extra pair of hand, pairs mm -hmm. of hands. So that's, that's good. Um, so I get the most senior registrar to continue to try to give them some some salbutamol. Mm -hmm. I'll get my my more junior registrar to draw up the ketamine in mm -hmm. 200 milligrams in um, 20 mils mm -hmm. and give 40 milligrams. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also ask them to draw up some magnesium and I'd ask them to titrate in the magnesium. I want them to give 20 millimoles over the next 20 mil minutes and for them to watch um, and manage the blood pressure at that time. Mm -hmm. And then the third task that I'm going to ask them to do is to look up the salbutamol um, intravenous dilution um, protocol for, or guideline that we have in our department because I can't remember it off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to start in, um, giving the salbutamol intravenously as we aren't currently ventilating the salbutamol in via the circuit. Look, you get to start, you, act, you action all of these steps and you get to a place where the sats are around 88% on 100% FI, still very severe bronchospasm noises, uh, wheeze, wheezes on auscultation, but you are able to get 200 mils of tidal volume in this patient, but with you're getting alarmings from the ventilator and your CO2 is now 100. Uh, what do you do? So I'm still working down my algorithm and um, I'll get a, my, a second tech to open up the Borshoff book and make sure that we're not missing any steps. Huh? I'm going to examine the patient and make sure that we don't have a pneumothorax, which might also be um, a, no uh, pneumothorax contributing to the difficulty in ventilating. 
Okay. The, bush, the, the book is missing, so it's all on you. Okay. And, and you, don't have, you don't have an iPhone with you for Google. Okay. Um, and at this stage, I'd probably crack out some adrenaline and start infiltrating adrenaline 10 mics per mil Ooh. just to try to help break the bronchospasm. Yeah. I'm going to apologize to the surgeon. I'm saying, I'm sorry, this is not safe for you to continue at the moment. We're going to have to stabilize this patient until we can, until Mm, that's fine. Before we can let you continue. I'm going to call the ICU consultant and ask about whether they have the capability of ECMO at this site. Let's say you get to a place now where you're uh, you're able to get 300 mils tidal volume uh, and the pressures are still very high to do that and the CO2 is now 120, but your SATs are 90% now. Okay. So I'm a little bit... A little bit more relieved. I can take a breath now that the um, oxygen oxygenation has improved. She still is very hypercapnic. I'm not as worried about that as long as her pH is normal. So I send an ABG and see what the pH is. Oh, the pH, still, is, pH is very low, 7.1. Okay. All right. I can't quite, quite take as deep a breath as I was hoping then. Um, so I still think that we need to withhold surgery until we can get on top of her gas exchange and I still want to have that discussion with the ICU doctors about she needs to go back to she needs to go to ICU intubated and um, there's a possibility that we're going to need to get her on ECMO if, if she is to have any further exacerbations of her um, of her bronchospasm. As you're leading the situation you've got the registrar vent ventilating um, and you notice the blood pressure is dropping now so the blood pressure the heart rate was 120 it's now 130 your uh, oxygenation is, as I've said, um, the, the, they're roughly bagging the patient at about 15 breaths per minute, and the blood pressure has now dropped from a stable 100 to 70. Okay. So now I'm concerned that we have hemodynamic compromise, and that could be because of the very high intrathoracic pressures um, exerting a sort of obstructive shock picture, mm -hmm. or it could be that she's blown a pneumothorax. Either way, the first thing I'm going to do is disconnect the ventilator um, disconnect the circuit from the patient's tube and ask the surgeons if they can um, help us decompress her chest, reconnect, get, see if that has alleviated the issue. You get immediate resolution from that. Um, okay. So now the blood pressure has come back up. Um, what do you dial on the ventilator? So I'm going to put her onto a volume control ventilation mode. What, why volume control? Um, because I have to choose one. <laughs> um, um, what's, what's the, the best volume... mode? What's the best mode for volumes? Uh, to get the most volume when you've got a severe bronchospasm? So it depends on the ventilator that you have. On the Hamiltons, it's a, it's a little bit easier to use a volume control a ventilation than on our anesthetic machines. Um, we have G, the Asus GE anesthetic machines. Let's say you've got an Asus GE because you're in theatre. Okay, well, then I probably would dial up um, pressure control if I can get the pressure limits as high as I need to to, to guarantee her volumes. I could use pressure control volume guarantee, um, which is the the mode that I use most commonly. Oh. That allows me to dial up a volume, and that's, that's I fine. Have... Tell me the other uh, parts that you're going to be um, uh, uh, so dialing up. I would put a respiratory rate of eight mm -hmm. um, with a very high IE ratio of one to eight, mm -hmm. um, and I would start with three or four of PEEP to try to match her a little bit of intrathoracic pressure and splint some of those small airways open. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work and within the first two minutes, then I would turn it down to zero PEEP. It's a quite a dynamic situation. She's got very brittle asthma, so it's not a set and forget. It's a set and watch mm -hmm. and out and um, tinker as you go. Okay. Our ventilators are not as good as the ICU ventilators and they're not as good as the transport ventilators as well. So if I'm really struggling with our ventilator, I'd ask for the transport ventilator to come in and I'd put her straight on the transport ventilator. Um, okay, good. Let's say you do this and you get to a level of safety for this patient um, and the patient actually goes to ICU and recovers over the next day. Um, yeah, so every, everything's things kind of sorted. A few days later, the patient recovers they're in, on the ward but you receive a complaint that a tooth has been chipped. What do you do? Well, I would, um, before going to see the patient, I'd probably discuss in, in my department with a trusted colleague who's come across this issue previously about what the pathways are in our department um, and and if, there are, if there's any issues that they have come up against it when they have had to pursue this pathway with a patient. Mm -hmm. And then I would go to the patient 
um, perform an open sort of disclosure re- recounting of the events that happened, acknowledge the um, injury that has happened, and then give her information and options about how she wants to progress this. Mm-hmm. Um, we're lucky at our institution that we have um, dental services available through the public health system at our at which is based for our state in, at our institution. So I would give her information about. Um, the referral pathway, write a referral for her. And I'd also give her information about the complaints pathway at our hospital and say that she doesn't have to, um, like, I'm anticipating that she may want to make a formal complaint. Um, she can make that at any time. If she decides not to at this point in time, that that avenue is always open. I'd also document all of um, the case for myself, as I would have considering that this was a, there was a critical event in theatre and also document about, about her dental injury and keep a copy of my own records and discuss with my MDO um, and then put a referral in for our departmental um, M&M meeting for discussion of dental injury uh, and also um, enter in a web as. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Any other place to report this for the hospital? For the hospital, so we have something called Datic Sims, which is a... Um, yeah, good. Uh, how, do you, how do you take care of the tooth? Let's say the tooth has been completely dislodged. What would you do with that? Ah, so that the tooth, the physical tooth, if it comes out, needs to be put in milk, uh, mm-hmm. and then she needs to have a rather urgent referral if it's if the tooth has completely been dislodged to see either the dental surgeons or the max fax surgeons. And so I think dental surgeons are at our institution mm-hmm. twice a week, whereas max fax we can reach uh, uh, on a more urgent basis after hours included. Excellent. Hey, Rebecca, that's the end of the Viber. <laughs> well done. Hey, so we're going to, uh, for the YouTube viewers, we're going to cut it there. And um, for the full discussion, it'll be on the final exam course and there'll be a link up, uh, hopefully sent up on this video anyway. Um, but yeah, let's let's get Now, what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey, from medical student to procedural skills, from foundations in anesthesia, as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well.